Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 23. My name is Kay Shivan, I'm the producer for this episode. Today's conversation is with Shauna, who is a 2021 Dalhousie University graduate and a 2021 Queens GDA graduate. In her final year at Dow, she served as the co-president of the Dalhousie Accounting Society, as well as the VP internal of the Dalhousie Commerce Society. And she joined Sam to discuss how she was able to thrive in an online school environment, balance studying full-time with working part-time at Deloitte, and how she defines her success amongst much more in the conversation. Sean is happy to chat, so please feel free to reach out to her. I linked her contact info in the description and as well, Sam's info is always there. Thanks and enjoy the episode. Hey, Shauna. So uh, you work with Megan Waterhouse, who is one of my first guests on this podcast. Um, yes, I do. She, yeah. Did she give you any warnings, any heads up? Does she know that you're doing this here with us now? No, I'm on vacation from work right now. So I haven't really been like on my work computer talking about it. But I remember when she did it, she actually mentioned me in the podcast. She did. Yeah. <laughs> and she, she told me. She, she told me she was like, oh, by the way, like I mentioned you at Sam's podcast and I went and watched it after and it was really nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's so it's such a small community, um, our Dal accounting community. And it's like before, during and after uh, alumni. Um, so it was really neat that that kind of organically happened <laughs> and that I actually didn't really think about it until we were about to go live. I was like, how are we going to kick this off? And I was like, boom, Megan Waterhouse. <laughs> so you want to return the favor and uh, give her a shout out, something nice or throw her under the bus. <laughs> oh my God. No, Megan's awesome. She's been like my, she started when I started part-time when I was in still, still in school and she's like a senior now and she's so nice and like helpful. And it's hard sometimes when you have questions, cause like you don't want to ask. Sometimes like you feel nervous asking people that are, like senior to you because you're like I don't want to seem stupid but Megan's so nice about it all the time good and I am not surprised and good because there's also a it's difficult because when like I remember being in that position and then both having staff and it's like you get kind of concerned when your staff aren't asking you questions you're like oh does this mean it's good and then like you learn after a bit you're like oh no that's bad because everybody <laughs> should have questions <laughs> and you're more scared about the people that are kind of like doing things um but you're you're and then you find out three weeks later you're like oh okay oops like maybe you would ask maybe if I should have asked if you should have asked so it's really smart that she's um and good and kind and part of her nature so no that's that's awesome to hear <laughs> Wow. So I forgot that you worked part-time um, for Deloitte in tax when you were um, a student at Dell, so during your years. So rather than start at the beginning, rather than starting at where you are at now, let's hop into the middle. How the heck did you get working part-time at Deloitte in tax while you were going to school? Um, so that actually rounds back to Megan again. I was recruiting with Deloitte for, there was some sort of like event where a bunch of people from Deloitte came and I remembered that they had mentioned Megan worked part-time and this happened, I think like at the beginning of my second year. And then for my third, my second co-op, so beginning of third year, I worked at Deloitte and I worked in Vancouver and I, I always work part-time during school. Normally I work at Dal in the admissions office, mm -hmm. but this time I was like, you know what? I think like, it'd be cool if I worked at Deloitte. Um, and I think it helped me like build my experience and make me a better like employee and better yeah. at tax. So I asked my, the partner that I worked with in Vancouver and he connected me to the partner in Halifax and the partner was like, yeah, like you, I just asked, like, is there an opportunity for part-time? Like, this is the kind of work that I've done. I think I could be helpful. <laughs> um, and I think it helped out too, because I did, I didn't do my first co-op at Deloitte, but I did do it in tax. Mm -hmm. So I had worked a busy season before. And so I started part-time in the Halifax office and I kept going with it through school. And then I did my third co-op with Deloitte in Toronto. And then I signed, I started working part-time again in Halifax and then I signed back full-time to Halifax. So you have worked um, tax before Deloitte, then you worked um, Deloitte in Vancouver and then Deloitte in Toronto. And then now you're going to be Deloitte full-time in Halifax. Yeah. So actually the only place I haven't worked full-time at Deloitte is in Halifax. So I'll start <laughs> in September. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. September. So, wow. Um, and I feel like 
when did we first meet? I feel like it was, correct me if I'm wrong, but sometime right, um, probably January, maybe, maybe December, but probably January. And you popped into my office and a third year, um, and want, just introduced yourself and said, Hey, I like to get to know my profs and put a face to my name. Like I'm Shauna. And then I struggled with the spelling versus like the pronunciation <laughs> of your name for like ever. Uh, and yeah, you were really kind. And that, is that correct? We actually met at the end of first year very briefly because you were the accounting professor for Sasha and Aiden and I hung out with them quite a bit. So I think like we had briefly met, but in December I did that. And then in January I was in your cost class. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I am sure I will like, it'll be like three o'clock. I'll be walking the dogs and I'm like, oh yes. (laughs) Because yeah, I, I had the great fortune of teaching first year as my first semester here and Shauna who, or for me, um, Sasha, who just graduated with you and Aiden will be graduating soon. Um, yeah, they were part of my first kind of group of students and it was really, um, really kind of interesting me thinking about them graduating and thinking of the different things of me being a Dell and now you guys have graduated. So uh, I definitely do miss um kind of teaching first year and maybe that'll be something that will come around because you get to like I got to see um and even just with you like that's you know 10 percent of like your life and like 50 percent of your DAO right two years um it's a good chunk of time and there's lots of growth there so we want to dig into some of that growth because I asked you to be on here because you not only have you worked part-time and um, been dedicated to your studies but would it be fair to say that you got involved with like your university experience? You got fully involved. Yeah. <laughs> yes. In a variety of different ways. <laughs> yeah. And we won't be able probably to touch on all of them. I actually, as much as you probably have a good memory, I actually wonder if you remember all that you've been involved in. I'm sure you have. No, I don't just, think so. It's a lot. <laughs> I like, I keep a list because when I update my resume, um, like sometimes I'll include some things and sometimes I won't, but I haven't looked at it in a a while ever since I graduated. So I should take a look at that because sometimes I'm like, somebody will say something and I'm like, oh yeah, I was on that. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's, that's awesome. So let's maybe dig into kind of the first couple things that you got involved with in first year. So you're coming in and it's first year. First of all, how did you know to get involved in things? Um, So I actually was a transfer student in first year. I did my first two years at U of T in science. And I I guess there, it's hard to meet people at U of T because the school is so Mm -hmm. big. So to kind of meet people with the same interests you would join clubs that you were interested in. And it wasn't really like a resume pattern or anything like that. It was just like, I want to make friends. And so I did that. And then when I came to Dal, I didn't know anybody uh, at all. Like I didn't have anybody from high school that came here. I, I think I knew one person that lived in like a neighborhood next to me whose cousin went to Dal or something like that. And then like, I I saw somebody. Yeah. So I saw him on the street once and I was like, oh, this is gonna be so weird. But I was like, because I just didn't know anybody. And then uh, so when I came, I wanted to know people, but I also wanted to know people in commerce because Hmm. I figured it was like kind of a smaller faculty. And so I the first thing that was introduced to us in one of the classes was DCS, the Commerce Society. And I think I don't know, maybe it was like the president would come around to the classes and just like introduce themselves and to like talk a little bit about the DCS. So I signed up to be a cases and conferences chair that year. Uh, I didn't really know what a case competition was or anything like that. I just thought it was That's interesting because that'll come full circle. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I just thought it was cool and interesting. So I was like, okay. Um, I had participated, like they were just called different things because I was more I didn't, I wasn't really business inclined at U of T. So I did like mooting competitions and um, I like had helped my, I had joined a competition late, but I didn't really grasp what it was because I wasn't in business. And so I just really focused on like, this is the objective of what we're doing. And I thought it was more like a presentation. So I didn't actually understand it. And then I joined that and 
uh, I think one of my friends at the time was a general member of the Women in Business Association. So I went to their general meetings a couple of times and I went to their conference that year. And I thought the conference had like a lot of potential and I wanted to sort of join in on that in the year after. Mm -hmm. um, so those, and I, I'm Dallas. Everybody just always talked about Dallas. <laughs> like everybody was doing it and everybody was going to it. So I think Dallas was something else that I, I was just like, okay, I'll just go to this. And I it made just, a few friends in all of them. Yeah. Sorry. Just for people, what does Dallas stand for? Just oh, the Dalhousie down. Investment Society. Okay. All right. Yeah. So this is where all the finance and accounting students hang out. I honestly, I think in the first couple of years, everybody just goes to Dallas. Oh, like awesome. I, a ton of my friends went, I don't even know if all of us went into accounting or finance, but I think in the first couple of years when you don't really know, and you haven't did, like first year, I think everybody yeah. goes. And then in second year, when you're kind of like, okay, maybe I'm like kind of gearing towards accounting or finance, then you keep going. And then I think in the third and fourth years, it's generally more finance people with like, there are people in accounting who were really kind of on the that's how I kind of saw it. everybody who was really on the fence about accounting or finance and they went into accounting I I found that they were pretty involved in Dallas too yeah I yeah. actually um a number of years ago I kind of held this info mini info session basically like finance or accounting um and had somebody that you know did both because I think now um as you continue to work and as you've seen kind of the progression through university as well as just jobs that are out there it's not typically one or the other like you can do both you can have your CPA and your CBB or your CPA and your CFA or uh like one of my colleagues like all three and like just keep going and like and niche down so it's actually kind of interesting to see the parallel with that um, in university within um, Dallas. So yeah, it's not an either or. It's like, hey, do both. And I love, love when I have finance students in my cost class um, mm -hmm. or and marketing. And like, because we talk about costs, you figure out costs, like what's a sunk cost? What's an opportunity cost? Like all of these things come to play in real life as well as like in finance or marketing. So that's really neat about Dallas. So you get involved, you make friends. How do you, like, I just want to know, how do you, like to any type like time management tips for students or things that you found worked well for you or things that you found didn't work well and you wish that you somebody would have said hey this might not really work out as well I think for me my key to like time management was I don't like studying in groups I like studying alone. And so my mindset was always like, oh, if I'm going to go study in a group, this is to socialize. Like I'm not studying. <laughs> um, and so like, I think that's kind of important to figure out, like, are you a group learner? Are you an individual learner? Because what I would do is I would study by myself and I would get things done by myself. And then I would go into a group if I had like questions or if I um, wanted to like bounce ideas off of other people. And I think figuring out how you study best and how you retain information best early on mm. is a good way to like manage your time and study effectively. Because I think in U of T and in high school, I did this a lot where I would just rewrite notes and then I, and like, and then I would do practice questions and that takes up a lot of time. Yeah. Whereas now I, especially like in my later years, I, completely stop doing that and what I would do is I would look at the type of like usually profs would give you like a practice midterm or specific practice yeah. problems to try and I would look at those and I would like link the concepts back so it's like Perfect. I'd look at the questions and it'd be like okay chapter 6.3 and then I would go to the slides and I'd be like I would read through chapter 6.3 I'd write down like the main concepts of it yeah. and if there's a part that I didn't understand then I would go back to the textbook and that worked for me but I know that doesn't work for everybody like I know friends that they want to like write notes from the textbook they want to write notes from the slides and that works really well for them and my way might not yeah, so I, no, think I think I think that's a really interesting thing to point out and I would say that it's not um if I were just like kind of interject with some like sciencey stuff um Typically, it's whatever you can do that's active. And I'm going to say writing notes isn't necessarily making it active. You, if you're reproducing what somebody else said, that 
typically doesn't make it tricky or make it sticky. But if you are getting key concepts, putting into your own words, mapping it somehow, either like visually or just, you know, moving concepts around linking. So any type of thing where you are exerting some sort of energy. So with you kind of backward mapping, what's the test? Let me reverse engineer it into things that I need to do and solve the, uh, solve the puzzle that way. Active learning. Perfect. Um, same thing. So students that are taking from the slides or taking from the textbook and maybe making their own notes and compiling and drawing lineage and then maybe applying it to tests. Perfect. Just doing something. Um, oftentimes we sit and we read and we reread and we reread. And while that might work for a certain number of people where they can just like memorize and then in a test, like have that recall for most people, um, one of my colleagues um, studies mind wandering and in order to combat mind wandering, mind wandering, which prevents you from actually like obtaining the information. It's being active, having some sort of active process. So I like what you said, figure out what works for you. If you don't know, that's cool. Try it one way, try it another way and, and yeah, be your own science experiment. So that's really good advice. Okay. So, um, Sorry, where were we on this? You were in Dallas trying out different things, figuring out how you studied, and, and that's the way that you manage your time best is by yeah. figuring out yourself. And then because I within like the first couple of months at Dow, I found I was studying like a lot. And I was like, mm -hmm. I don't want to be studying this much. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I must be doing something wrong. And then I think that's when I started trying out different things. Like I, I tried only doing practice problems, but then I was like, okay, I don't really know what's going on. And then I tried like only looking at the slides. And then I was like, if this comes on a test, I'm not going to know what to do. So I, it was a lot of trial and error before I figured out what works best for me. But then once I did, I, I started, like, I did still study, but I spent a lot less time than I was before. And that kind of helped free up the rest of my time. And that way I was able to get involved with different things. And I think, especially for me, I like keeping my schedule really busy during the week. I think mm -hmm. that just like helps keep my mind active. It helps keep me like more focused and productive. So I, like in my first and second year before co-op, I was in societies, I was full-time in school and I worked part-time, I think like 15 hours a week. And so pretty much from like nine till seven or eight-ish, my time every single day was blocked off for during the weekdays, which was nice because then when I would just do nothing on the weekends or like have fun on the weekends, mm -hmm. I never felt guilty about it because I was like, I know I'm doing everything I need to get done in the weekday. It's interesting that you work 15 hours a week um, on average and none of it was on the weekends. Is that correct? Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, not, not like a good or bad, just like interesting. So that's really, yeah, you like the sprints and then the recovers. When I, when I should say sprints, like the sprinty marathons, five on and then two off. Cool. That is um, something, yeah, that I haven't heard before from a student or a colleague, but I like it. And it's almost representative of like a kind of what you may anticipate your future, like for the next like year or two to be, hey? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no. So it's, it's actually very, very smart and strategic. Cool. So then, all right, you were at Reba, uh, DCS, um, Dallas, your first few years. And then we hit third year. So third year, first semester, um, you know, like you said, everybody's on co-op. You come back, um, you start sort of the main accounting courses. So you have cost accounting and IFA one. And um, so we kind of have third year before <laughs> the shutdown and after the shutdown. So tell me, I think, I think what I'm most curious about is how did you adapt? How did you find that disruption of, you know, we're sitting there on March 12th or 11th and, you know, over the weekend, we find that you like, you're likely not going to finish off third year back in person. What was going through your mind then? So I, I was actually, so that semester when I worked part-time, I worked on Tuesdays and Fridays and the third, the 12th fell on a Friday. And I remember throughout the week, like different schools in Ontario were like, we're shutting down, we're shutting down, we're shutting down. And I, like, I remember it so clearly. I was checking my phone every 15 minutes because there was like all these new updates. And then we finally get the email from Dal. It was like, and I was talking, I, it Deloitte that day was like the night before it was like, nobody has to come into the office tomorrow if you don't feel comfortable. And because I don't check my laptop unless I'm at work, I didn't know. 
And so when I came in, it was just myself and my senior at the time. And it was just the two of us in the office and him and I were just talking throughout the day. And I, we were talking about school shutting down in COVID. And I remember him saying like, oh, I think this will be like a couple months and then we'll be fine. Everybody just needs to stay home. And I was like, no, like, I think this is going to be a big deal. And it was like 332 or something. And I went to him and I was like, Dal, just shut down for like, we don't have school for the next week. And I think at the time, honestly, it was kind of exciting because at that point we had no cases in Nova Scotia. We didn't really, I didn't really grasp COVID as well because it was kind of like, it wasn't here. Yeah. I don't think anybody around us um, that maybe didn't have an international like touch point did. So that's completely, I guess, normal for what we were all encountering at the time. So you were like, sweet, a week with no classes, like let the profs figure it out. Maybe, perhaps. Pretty much. Yeah. I was like, (laughs) okay, this is going to be fine. And then it was almost like my world got turned around. So Mm -hmm. I lived in like a house and then Sasha and I were moving in together. And so the guys that lived in the house we were moving into on the Friday were like, we're leaving tomorrow. Um, You guys are free to move in. And I think at that point when everybody started leaving is when I was like, okay, this is some, like, I don't know what to do anymore. And so Sasha and I both moved into this new house early and then she left for Ontario. And at the time it was like, I think because I was just so involved with other things where I was like, oh, I was moving. I was worried about how school was going to go. And then I had to figure out work from home. Um, I didn't really focus on COVID. Yeah. And I think that was like on the Sundays, like they're like, we have our first few cases in Nova Scotia. And I was like, okay, every, like it's time to lock down. And it was so crazy going into like grocery stores. Cause it was actually just like havoc everywhere. Everybody just looks so scared. <laughs> and then it was locked down. And I think honestly, I kind of, I liked lockdown at the time because and it worked out this year too, where every time I move into a new place, there's a lockdown. And it's almost like I got a chance to kind of adapt to where I was living and get my affairs in order and really like figure out at that point, I was like, okay, I figured out a work from home setting. How am I going to kind of like put a boundary between like school work and my life and that just didn't happen (laughs) because I just didn't have a life um (laughs) nobody did (laughs) nobody did like which honestly was like it was bad for me but I did so well in like school (laughs) and um I like at work too because I just there was nothing there was literally nothing else to do and you couldn't see people because you were so scared for COVID. So I was in that house by myself. I would wake up at nine to start working. I would work from nine till about like one. And then I would do school from like, because at the po- at that point, we didn't have synchronous classes either. Everything was just videotaped. So uh, from one until around like five or six, I would um, like watch class videos and like try to do a little bit of work. Um, but some of the stuff just wasn't sticking. And I think there was a little bit of like exhaustion involved with COVID, especially like mentally and emotionally, because it was something that I just wasn't equipped for. And then it happened and I was like, okay, like I, I really don't know what to do now. And so I found like, it took a lot out of me to even want to try and study and work was a little bit better because it had just started online. So my coworkers and I were talking all the time, like on Skype or we were calling and we had a lot to talk about, but because COVID was new, but Mm. school became much more independent and you weren't really collaborating at the time. So school became very hard to be motivated for. And then I'd finish school at six, I'd eat, maybe watch like an episode of TV or something. And then I'd either go back to work or I would just go to sleep. Yeah. Life got a lot simpler and a whole lot more complicated at that time like right and just yeah there were fewer (laughs) things to do but then more time to just like be in our own head and think about what's next and what's this going to look like so thank you for being you know just so transparent that it was it was hard and you know we're still dealing with things that are hard and things that are unknown um and I think that what was it? The third shutdown? I know um, rocked me the hardest, probably, Um, because the first I had you guys. So I was just thinking, I'm like, okay, like this is, this is my job, right? Um, And no matter what you're thinking or feeling, like that doesn't really matter, right? Do your job. But um, the third shutdown was no job. Like I, 
you know, classes were out. Um, they had just gotten out. Um, we had just filmed our grad, um, Laura Tamia had just filmed our grad send off for you guys. And then we shut down and I was like, Oh goodness. Like we were free. Like, I don't want to go back to that. Like we were free. Like what is happening? And, um, I really had to take some time to just reset and regroup and get a better routine and really, um, refine my, my positive mindset. And why I'm bringing this up is because it sounds like as much as you were like, this sucks and there's unknowns, I'm hearing a lot of positives out of this. Um, a lot of like just honest assessments and things for you, like you said, when it was harder to get back in the group of school, but you did it and you got to know your coworkers. And actually this leads me to a really interesting point because, you know, I live and love my job and I am so inspired um, by our students because some, you can only kind of help it, but sometimes I compare where I was at to where you guys are at. And that's what is constantly so surprising and like not surprising in a bad way, but just like empowering. And I'm like, dang, these like our students, our Dallas students have it going on. Um, so not only did we lock down, you don't know what work's going to look like. You don't know what your fourth year is going to look like. Um, you finish off your third year on a positive note, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not just assuming I, I have some insider information, but yeah. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> um, and then, you know, going into fourth year, we, we find pretty, I think it was like kind of rumory, but you know, rather early on, we kind of knew, okay, this probably won't be an in-person fourth year for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that as a student, I probably would have checked out at that point. And I don't blame anybody that did. And, um, because it is a lot, it is a lot fourth year on its own is hard. Um, as fourth year counting on its own is hard. Um, and then to deal with all these things. So that's why I really want to highlight what the heck you did. And I want to talk, you know, I don't want to skim over your dedication to your studies and, um, and your work-life balance through a fourth year. I do want to get back to that. Or I do want to acknowledge your, your dedication to your studies and that this is, was a very high standard for you, but I really want to highlight in a time when nobody would blame you if you said F it and checked out, what did you do? What clubs were you involved in? How did you bring joy to other people and help lift them up um, throughout fourth year? Uh, and I, I want to start if we can with um, the Dalhousie Accounting Society. Okay. I, I actually, I love the Accounting Society. The Accounting Society was like my baby um, pretty much in we didn't hear much about it. Like, I think in my first year, there was like a couple of sessions in my second year, there was nothing. And in my third year, there was nothing. And then in my third year, I had reached out to the old presidents and I was like, can I take this on? And they were essentially like, of course, like take it. Yeah. But they were pretty much just like, we receive funding from DCS. And like, if nothing gets done this year, like no pressure, but like, if nothing gets done, then we're not going to get any funding from DCS anymore um which makes sense because if you're not doing anything what do you need the funding yeah. for um and so that year I was like okay I really sat back and I was just like why is this not what what is wrong with the society that it's not working because we have so many accounting students we have so many accounting students that are involved in things what's specifically wrong with this and I think what I kind of figured out is one there was no team and two there was no continuity so mm -hmm. in our like in my first year um I think Bryce Cross was the president oh. and so yeah so he did a ton of stuff but then I think the, his co-president was also the same year or something like that mm -hmm. and then they left and then the next year it was Zach Brandt yeah. I believe and then he left and, and then the, the podcast <laughs> oh was he on the podcast yeah <laughs> He actually, he was one of our like panel guests. Like he had reached out and was like, is there anything, any way I can help? And we were like, yeah, of course you want to come talk. Um, but yeah, so he was the president and then he left. And afterwards, like, I think it was just, there was always the same year presidents. And mm -hmm. so I was like, okay, that's not working like clearly. So this, this past year, I was like, okay, I think it's smart if we always have a fourth year president and a third year president, that way there's someone who knows what to do to come in as the fourth year one. And like, it kind of helps build that continuity. 
So Claire Kilgore, she worked at Deloitte with me and I've known her through like other clubs and societies. And uh, I had known her for a couple of years, but that was the first time that we really started talking and becoming friends. And I was just like, she, she was kind of involved in things that I was kind of like, Hey, Claire, like, I'm thinking of be, like taking on this accounting society and I'm looking for a co-president. Like, do you want to do it? And I think she was a little hesitant at first because I had dropped the whole, yeah, by the way, if we don't do anything, like they just don't get funding anymore. <laughs> and she was oh, like, sure. okay. <laughs> and she, like, I think about she, she was like pretty excited about it after. And then we just planned the entire summer. Like we were, we called each other at least once a week for like a few hours every time. And we had pretty much built it from scratch and we were doing kind of trial and error and we were being very conservative with like our numbers so we were like we would rather have a bigger team than a smaller team in the case that like it does do super well and we need more hands we'd rather have that from the inception rather than hiring in the middle so we formed a team and it was really good and then we were like okay we need we tried to get numbers from DCS at the beginning and we're like okay what does this look like like how like what do you think we can get and they it didn't seem like we could get a lot which made sense because there was nothing to base it off of so we built a budget from scratch and like we applied to a bunch of like the DSU grants but that didn't work either because we weren't ratified with the DSU so we were like okay we need to figure out another way to do this and then Claire and I one day we were just like screw it let's just do corporate sponsorships like other societies do it why not yeah and I so I as the cases and conferences chair in the last year I had helped build the sponsorship booklet for the Atlantic Throwdown and I was kind of using that as a template and then we built our sponsorship book from scratch we like wrote all of it did it all on Canva ourselves like found contacts distributed them out and then I think we got like 2,500 um, in sponsorship for the accounting society which was and that was before school started wow that is amazing and we just like kind of powed through it the entire summer and which was and we had we held our first event and we were so nervous about this but it was like a week long like week long workshops where to talk about like co-op and recruiting and that kind of stuff and so every day we did a different um a different topic so I think one was like coffee chats and one was interview tips and resumes cover letters Mm. and we got fourth year students and third year students to run these workshops with us and that way like the first and second years had older students that they kind of knew and could ask questions to and I think at the peak of it we had I think one of them had like 25 people show up wow but I actually heard that you guys had a bit of a wait list after like people heard about it afterwards and we're trying to get in contact with some of the coaches yeah which is awesome because we told them that we like put all our contact info at the end and we're like if you have any questions like please reach out and it was really it was honestly really awesome because I had a ton of students that were applying to Grant Thornton and Deloitte like the two places that I did my co-ops to be like oh like I see that you did this like I'm really nervous what can I do so I had a couple like phone calls after that with that and it was awesome after seeing all of them get jobs and post about it on LinkedIn yeah I saw you tagged a lot that was awesome (laughs) that's really really cool and yeah building something and seeing the first one and having the nerves and doing it anyways right so yeah um amazing what what other events did you guys hold like hold throughout the year and one of the reasons I'm asking also is because recently in the newsletter um Claire your co-president um put some advertising out for this upcoming year. So I do want to like plug that a little bit in case we have some uh, third years going to fourth years or just, you know, potential accounting students that are interested. So what other kind of events were held and like, how did you get your team involved? Uh, So with our, our team was involved throughout, like we had, we kind of modeled it after the DCS. So we added an external portfolio and internal and marketing and finance so the finance people throughout were like tracking sponsorship making up budgets the marketing people like we were really big on social media like that was our main point of kind of connecting with the students so we did a ton of stuff for social media we were posting stuff all the time we did these like takeovers and it was just like I would 
log on to the Instagram for an entire day and I would just talk about like what I was doing and then we'd have question boxes where people could ask questions so people asked about like why I picked accounting where I did my co-ops like what recruiting was like and that kind of stuff and then I think Claire did one we had a couple of our other execs do some too um so the, the marketing team kind of focused on like making social media posts and campaigns we could do to kind of get more engagement in the society Mm -hmm. our internal portfolio focused on um like setting up and managing the events and kind of figuring out which events to do and the external like spoke to panelists and like our sponsors and that kind of stuff so uh, some of the big ones that I in the beginning we had a lot of uh like we had a fourth year I think info session not an info session but kind of like we would just talk about fourth year and we would talk about kind of where we did our co-ops and then we had graduated students come back so I think Zach Brandt was part of that one um and then we did prep sessions for the accounting like finals so I think I did one for financial accounting um in first year and which was honestly it was good for me because I got some of the students to like send me the notes and I think Kyla had sent me some of her stuff too and she sent me the syllabus and I was looking at it and I was like man this has been a while (laughs) hey repeated exposure same or similar materials it's never bad to go back (laughs) yeah and so I think I was running it and Sasha was helping me uh and we had like our execs there too we had a ton of students come in and um so we ran that and we also had a big Movember event um it was men let's talk and what we had is we had like a mental health facilitator uh and we had a round table of like mental health uh, not sorry not mental health professionals like accounting people and like finance people within Halifax so we had um, someone from MUFG we had a tax partner from Deloitte a tax partner from EY and um we had Benode from the row and we they would just ask questions and like kind of talk about their experiences and at the end they broke out into workshops um where it was like the person from like the company and we had student leaders from Dow so I think like a lot of the presidents and the execs on various different societies showed up and uh, we had just a ton of students and they were all able to like we had questions that kind of popped up in all the breakout rooms and they talked about that and leading up to that we did spotlights too so we spotlighted certain profs and we spotlighted like student leaders and spotlights for like the corporate um guests that were coming in on social media to kind of get to know a little more about everybody uh so that was our big event for the fall and then in the winter we actually hosted a case competition and a women's week uh so Deloitte was our platinum sponsor for the accounting society so it was the Deloitte with DAS and we called it the row invasion and it was accounting based which was cool and we got uh we had partners from Deloitte who were the judges and so that turned out really well and I think that a lo- it was really great because we had a few first and second years join in which allowed for them to get exposures to case competitions and honestly yeah. mm-hmm. for the JDI one too yeah because we yeah. were like at the end of it we kind of debriefed it a little for some of them like I know some of them reached out personally and were like what could we have done or like what were we supposed to look at and it wasn't too accounting heavy but it was like accounting enough that yeah. like to consider it and then our second one was women's week where oh, no, I, I want to sorry I want to go back to the case competition because this is where um, I think we can kind of come full circle a little bit so you've kind of been involved in case-ish things at U of T in science come to business and you are seeing more and more um you know case elements and different items were you involved at all in PepsiCo no, I wasn't. So act, that's actually interesting because until fourth year, I was the cases and conferences chair. So I knew I ran the ACE the case workshop a couple of times and I knew a ton about cases at that point, but I was never allowed to join in on them because I was a cases and conferences chair. Yeah. Okay. So this is really interesting. Okay. So case and conference chair always had the conflict. So of course you can't, you know, uh, independent in fact and appearance. So <laughs> Um, okay. And then you bring that and you, um, you and your team lead the, um, the invasion, the Deloitte invasion, which I think is an amazing, um, concept. And you're right. It is really neat that there aren't a ton of accounting like based competitions. 
you know, perhaps in JVCC with the accounting team, but that's, you know, three students that may get involved with something. Um, whereas this was, was bigger, was much, much bigger. And you alluded to linking it back to JDI. So just in case people don't know, JDI, um, if it happens again this year, so hopefully it does, uh, is in your third year in IFA 1, um, or, uh, JD Irving will come in and work with um, a case. You can probably speak to it a little bit better than me, but what I believe is you get into groups of four or five, um, you have some time, maybe, what is it, like 96 hours? Like it's relatively short. Um, and then you present for a full day in front of um, uh, JD Irving managers, uh, et cetera. And then there's winners and cash prizes. And I think if you win, you also get an automatic like A or an automatic like 100 or something, right? Uh, so it was one week, I think we got, okay. we got one week for it. And then it's worth 5% of your course or something like that. And you would get an A, like a hundred percent for that 5%, yeah, like automatically. If, if, yeah, you win. if you win. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, amazing. So yeah. So you debriefed and I think like going to where, what you just finished the summer. So you can you graduated in, um, May and you completed the Queen's program. So we had Ali and Laura on and we talked a lot about the Queen's program. So I'll probably just, I don't want to like, I don't want to downplay any of this because, you know, I think you're awesome. So it's not, and have a lot to share with um, students. So I really want to focus on like the elements that maybe perhaps um, are more unique to you that you can share. So I just want to ask one thing that happened between the Deloitte invasion <laughs> um, you had competed, I think, in um, JDI and then um, Queens, where it was heavily case based to get through core one, core two assurance and tax um, electives. And that was, and my gosh, forgive me if I'm, again, what is the case um, competition where it was um, row uh, MBAs against BCom people? Uh, I think it's the MBA. No, it's not the MBA games, it's Rumble in the Row. Rumble in the row. So sometime, somewhere between all of this, as you're finishing up your fourth year, um, did you organize Rumble in the row? No, I came second. No. In the row. And so, what were you allowed to do? I, I participated. Yes, you not only participated. I came second. <laughs> yes, you and your team came second. Which there was a number of teams, and you were um, part of a team representing undergrads in that year. Uh, the MBA is one, but yeah, like you won. Are you, I think, I, I don't know. I think anybody that plays this, like for a second or third, like won, right? Like that's amazing. So you finally get to use your case knowledge. You build up, you give back to the community and then you, you go out and do that and are successful. So like, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I was really glad because I got to also participate in Atlantic Throwdown, or I think it's called the Atlantic Case Competition now. Yeah. Um, I also play second in that one, which was awesome because I think that really brought into perspective how important cases are because we were against some of the Ontario schools and I was like, damn, like we need to start doing cases much earlier because mm -hmm. we, it was a prepared, it was a prepared case. So we had time to see it. And I saw some of the presentations later and I was like, you could have given me four months to do this. And I would not have been able to come up with something to this caliber. <laughs> It is a skill set, and I will I will just um, talk you up a bit. Um, like you just completed a Queen's graduate diploma in what was it under three months, where predominantly they are filled with Ontario students. So you know, like it's it's all good, right? It's cases and you know specifically case competitions. Like you said, they're a skill set. Um, hold on though, what was something to do with you and Sasha this year? You guys, I feel like. The IFP competition. Yes. Tell me about that. So that's a competition that happens every year. Uh, we have a coach, um, John Class, who's associated with Dal, and he like coaches the students. And pretty much what happens is the IFP is the Institute of Advanced Financial Planners, and they release like a case competition every year. And we, they release the case, I think, in like March or something and then you read it you prepare your you prepare a one page report on what your case like what your presentation would be you submit it and you make a video so Sasha and I had done it for 
two years and in the past year we won and it's against everyone in Canada they so we submitted our report and we made a video and our videos like the past couple of years so they're marked on like random not random things but like one of the things is creativity and in both years we got like a hundred percent in that (laughs) because we always make it like really quirky and weird (laughs) um but we won it this year and this year it was online and so your prize is normally what they do and it's really sick they fly you out to wherever the symposium is you stay there for a few days you have like a kind of like a booth representing Dal and you talk to Dal and you get exposure to all these people that are financial planners um but the interesting thing about that is people who are usually financial planners are also uh, like have other designations. So there's like a lot of CPAs, CFAs and all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we made, we, you do a 45 minutes, minute presentation with your group in front of everybody. And it's super cool. Cause it's like interactive and people can like pull on things and vote on things. Um, which I've heard, I, Bryce Cross won it, I think twice. And it was really funny. Cause I talked to him about it when we were making our presentation and he's like, you have done everything that I did. <laughs> like, it's almost as if I was, and I didn't know Bryce until I think my like second year, but it's almost as if I had like followed in his footsteps, the entire way through um but yeah so that's real like that's a really interesting one to get involved in yeah no sorry I um released a podcast with Bryce a few weeks ago we had actually recorded it a number of months ago um and I met up with him to kind of touch base uh last week and he mentioned um speaking with you fairly recently and he just he has such nice like such wonderful things to say and it's, it's so neat for me to like realize like that you guys, like, of course I know you know each other or could, um, but it's just neat to know that like, you guys are just so supportive of one another and, and the support goes all ways. Like, I feel like maybe you guys feel the support and then you can't but help but like give it back and, you know, have these cool experiences, win these cool competitions, travel, like experience, and then you want to share it and you want to like, you know, create your own competitions and, you know, and give back and, you know, just even being here, letting people know what you've done, how you've done it. Um, different people that you've talked to, um, helps them kind of realize, Hey, wait a minute, that's cool. Um, do you think anybody can do one of these things? Like, do you think anybody can get involved in, um, we bought Dallas or the Dallas County society, or do you think there's people that, that should stay away? Uh, I I don't think so. I think there's something for everyone, but I think like it's important to consider that you might not want to do what everybody else wants to do. And I I think that's kind of what I struggled with in the first couple of years because I liked Dallas and I liked Weba, but I knew that it's almost like it wasn't a good fit Hmm. where I'm like, I don't like, I don't feel passionate about these things. Like there's maybe it was just like the structure of it or like the events that were happening where I'm like, I like don't really feel a connection to these things, but it was interesting because I did feel that for DCS. Like I love the DCS. I'm so passionate about the DCS. And it was easy for me to feel that way about the accounting society because I was the one with like Claire kind of curating what we were going to do. So I think it's important to like, I think everybody can get involved and everybody should, but don't, I it like try your best to kind of figure out what does it for you and what's good for you and what you like because it's you can get involved in these societies and some people don't want to be involved to like a huge extent and they have other responsibilities and that's totally fair but it's like it's so much more um, fulfilling when you're doing it for something that you care about and you love. Because every event that I ran with DAS and everything that I've done for DCS afterwards, I felt so great and so validated from it. Whereas like I, like I felt good about some of the stuff that I've done for other societies, but it wasn't like to the same extent at all. So what's really neat is there's no way of knowing until you go and try. So it Mm -hmm. even sounds like going out, you know, being part of these groups where you're like, I like what they're doing. They're great people. It's just, this isn't something that's necessarily for me for the long term. It was still a good experience, but it also helps you realize what else, maybe what you don't want to, you know, pour 17 hours a day, (laughs) every day over the summer or, you know, and that's okay. Um, That is absolutely okay. So there's no kind of secret formula other than like go out and try and you, you'll never know you'll never be able to test it sitting from your couch and and wishing and hoping you would have tried something 
Mm -hmm. And if, if like going in and becoming a member or applying for something seems like a little bit too much of a commitment at first, I would recommend just going to the events, like go to the events, go to some of like, I know I, especially, I think school's online on in person this year. So, which is super exciting because I think now that people haven't been engaged, there's going to be a lot more like random engagement events. So the DCS in my first and second year would have like, it wasn't even office hours. It was just like every Friday they had coffee in the DCS lounge or something. And you could go and members of the DCS were there. Like the VPs were there. The president was there and you could just talk to them. And I think that was a really neat way to get people more interested in the DCS. And I, I think a lot of societies might start doing that this year just to put names to faces and get to know each other a little better. Absolutely. And yeah, yeah. Get out, meet people, talk to them. Um, if it's intimidating to go to an event, you know, see if they can go to a coffee hour or a coffee event. If that's intimidating, maybe follow them on social, like follow the groups on social media for a bit and see what's going in. And then, and then maybe, you know, reach out, have a coffee. Um, maybe con- connect with um, Shauna and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing X, Y, and Z. Any tips? Um, I don't want to put volu- volunteer you, but you know, or one of the people, you know, Claire, she's the, still the uh, accounting co-president. People like to give advice because we all know how it feels to kind of want to do something, but also are wondering, is this really for me, or should I should I be there? Or do I do I fit in? And just go try, meet, um, have it work out. Um, but one of the things I really wanted to highlight that you just said is this year will probably be in person. And for all that we know, we should be. Um, Which really highlights and contrasts that all of last year was online. You did all of this online. When people are figuring out what the heck is online, you just did it. So what made you think that you could um, not only resurrect um, DAS, but make this year bigger and better and really secure funding possibilities right um for the future because it was like if you don't produce there's no no future so what made you think that you could do this in an online environment and what really even more than that like what made you look at the positives and go forward versus letting the negatives hold you back So the first part of that, like what made me think I could do that, I think online honestly made me feel like like I could do anything Mm. because there was no boundary to it. Like there was no kind of, oh, I have to be here and I can't be here when I'm here and like schools conflicting with this. And for me, I was just like, I can do anything online. Like I can send an email. I, and because everybody else has to do stuff online too, it was so much easier to coordinate things because I know like I prefer online meetings. Like I prefer Skype calls and video calls, but I know other people like meeting in person. And I know a lot of stuff was very in-person based. And I just, I was at school or I was at work and I didn't have time to do a lot of those things. So for this, I was like, okay, this is perfect because I can do a video call in 15 minutes so that made me think I could do so much and it it, honestly I could because I had the time and I sending an email to someone is so simple and because now everyone's at home they they're checking their email (laughs) where before it's like okay I can send this email to this person that works at like this company and maybe I'll get maybe they'll see it But now I'm like, no, I know you're going to see it. (laughs) I'll send this email and I'll follow up a month later. (laughs) And I like, I got pretty much a hundred percent response rate. Like, even if people were like, no, we can't sponsor you. I got a response. And then that way it was like easier to kind of build that connection to be like, oh, okay, well, thank you so much. And then some people were like, we had just like filled up our donation, like quota or whatever it is for this quarter, reach out to me at this time. And so that was- (laughs) Yeah, I was like, I will. <laughs> You're like, auto delay. <laughs> you won't be hearing from me. I love so, this. You saw this as an opportunity. You saw this as an yeah. opportunity. Um, and nobody told, like, I, I want to, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but nobody told you that this was an opportunity. You just assessed your strengths and weaknesses as you have been during your whole degree. And you were like, wait, this could actually be really good for me. This is what I want to pursue. And you made it a positive thing. Yeah. And honestly, I think a lot of it came from like, I was really bored and I didn't in the summer, I was alone for a lot of it. I hated that I was working all the time. And I, I saw, so my roommate at the time didn't live with me. Um, and he lived 
uh, like by himself. So once a week when we were both done work, he would come and visit me on Saturdays and I was part of his bubble. So he would come, we would do something on the weekend. He would take me grocery shopping. Then he would go back and I wouldn't talk to anybody for the next five days. And so I'm like, okay, I have all this time. Um, I might as well do something with it. Because at that point I was like, I've I'm on TikTok all the time, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, I watch so much TV, but I'm in front of my screen all the time. I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to do anything that makes me feel like my brain is dying yeah. um, <laughs> because I already feel that way at work. So I need to change things up a little bit. And I, I really like like Canva and I really like like meeting people so I did a ton of like coffee chats for the sponsorships where I'd send the email and they'd be like do you have a t- do you have a second for a phone call and I was like absolutely call me <laughs> anytime <laughs> like, I, was like, <laughs> I was like I'm dying to talk to somebody call me <laughs> um so things like that really um made me feel like it was an opportunity and a positive and it helped me feel like I did something over quarantine because I saw a lot of stuff which I think was really bad um to like a lot of people were like what did you do over quarantine like I lost this much weight or I started my own company or something like that and I was like okay like what come on I can't <laughs> like, my shit together <laughs> like, yeah I was like I, I didn't mean, cry every day <laughs> really yeah exactly I was like I didn't cry every day like yeah. <laughs> that's a big win yeah. for me and I think it's so hard to see that but um to see things like that like it's great for them but for me I'm like okay I'm not doing anything I'm doing this co-op job and afterwards I'm like by myself so kind of getting these projects was really helpful for me to feel like I did something and to feel like I did something that I actually liked and cared about and I think coming into school online was awesome because after I'd done that all summer I'm like okay I'm pretty like well adapted to how things run online I just did this entire co-op job online I did school Mm -hmm. online for a little bit and so when school started I think there was a little bit of an adjustment where in person, it's like you get spoon fed the information that you'll need for the entire semester. Like not necessarily the content of the class, but it's like, this is the syllabus. Like, this is how we're breaking down grading. Like, and you can sit there and like ask a ton of questions and stuff like that. And um, I think like, so, like you had posted a video, like kind of going through the syllabus and like going through the weeks. And for me, I was just like something about that. I just couldn't grasp. Like, I think it was pretty much end of September where I was finally like, okay, I understand what's going on in all of my classes. And Allie and Laura were like a huge help to me because f- from the get go, they were, they were like on top of everything. And because we did everything together, they'd be like, Hey, like, how's this going? And I'm like, oh, okay. I have to do that. <laughs> like, when is that due? <laughs> yeah. That's actually a common theme that I heard um, throughout this year is that um, a lot, even though a lot of the classes didn't have group work, there was group work being done in like a survival and in a thriving situation where you guys kind of came to, a lot of people did come together with different strengths and weaknesses. So that's awesome to hear. <laughs> you know, it just, yeah, I've been involved in different online classes, both as an educator and as a teacher. And sometimes it clicks and sometimes, um, and I'm just talking about the the straight up, just like how it's outlined, right? Not necessarily like the technical um, and other times it doesn't. And there can be a number of, of situations. So I absolutely don't take that personally. And I think it's awesome that you, that you reached out to your network, your people, right? Like um, you're going into Deloitte um, for, gosh, this will be, you've had three co-ops, one in tax or all in tax, I guess, right? All in tax. Yeah. All in tax. Yeah. Two in Deloitte starting full time in September ish. And so like starting off experienced at some point, even though, and I believe you're taking, you're going to do day two in tax. So you're writing and your tax roll. I haven't decided yet. Possibly. Okay. So, but it's, it's possible. It's on the oh, table. Oh yeah. It's on, it the, is table. on the table. Um, at some point when people get their CPAs, most students, most candidates, most CPAs will be relatively the same amount of smart, right? Or at least that's what you can kind of prove with the designation. Like this is our base. And then it really is those soft skills that, and I got to say, like, I'm an old school CA where somebody said soft skills to me 10 years ago. And I'd be like, eh, right? Like just not mature. I'd be like, oh, like you can't do technical, like you can't consolidate. Like, and it's so funny because 
as I've been able to grow throughout my own career and see what's made difference for me, but also just my, like my colleagues, um, students I've seen come up and people that really just are, are killing it. It's like, those are the skills. It's taking what you know and communicating it. It's working with people um, that are in, in similar paths. It's working with people that are not. It's working with people like above, you know, um, up and coming. It's, it's all of the other stuff because oftentimes if you want to be the, like, if you want to be proficient, it's having, you know, those other skills, those soft skills, the ability to take on a project that you haven't done before. And maybe it is some technical, maybe it's more HR type stuff, right? Maybe it's building a conference, maybe it's reaching out to sponsors, maybe it's hopping on a call, maybe it's like all of these things come together. Um, and as a CPA, as a Dow student, as you know, somebody who's just looking to align their values with um, and their kind of sense of meaning with their day-to-day -day activities, um, like that's just so huge. So I don't want to discount that. I don't want it to sound like it's an other thing. Like it is the thing. And it is one of the reasons what, like why I wanted to highlight this because it took me a long, long time to realize, um, to realize that. And it's a little bit of a shame and it's a whole lot more fun when you're when you're technical enough or technical and then building those other things that really communicate that and adding value. So was that something deliberate that you've done or is it something that, I don't know, just is, is fun and comes easy to you or if that like the soft skills part of it. Yeah. I think it was honestly something that came to me during recruiting. So I found that like, because I, I do well in school, um, and I do the right extracurriculars, I was like, okay, this is enough. Like, this is what they want. But it's important to consider that a ton of people do that. So like, what sets you apart? And I think that's kind of where I was like, okay, what does set me apart? And I, for me, it was just like, I talk to people quite easily and I make friends very easily. And so that's, kind of how all of my recruiting has gone where it went from a point where it's like I was applying and I was like checking all the boxes to make sure like I had this GPA I had like this on my resume I had this to I since my second co-op applying for my second co-op I've done recruiting like a, a, a few times because like with COVID I didn't know if I was going to get a job and all this stuff I have never applied to a job since everything I've done it was like all soft skills based so I like reached out to people on LinkedIn and I was like hey do, like can I like talk to you about your role or can I talk to you about this company or can I talk to you about your department sorry so you reached out to them on LinkedIn and you said I want a job give me a job no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, no, but, sorry. You said something else. You said, I want to know about your job. I want yeah. to know about your company. I want to hear about your experience. At what point did you say, give me a job? I never said that. <laughs> like, I, I would definitely include, because, like, I wanted them to know, like, I am looking for a job. But the way that I included it was in a more subtle way where I'm like, I'm a fourth year student that's about to graduate. Yeah. And so then they're like, People okay. Yeah. And they're like, okay, she's a fourth year student means she's going to be a new grad next year. All right. And so like pretty much every single person had called me or we had had a Skype call and uh, through every single LinkedIn message I sent out, I had received a job offer from it. And which was awesome because yeah. then I was like, um, I was like, okay, at least now I have like options to assess. Ultimately, I went with Deloitte every single time. <laughs> um, but, but, but you, in a situation, what I love about this is uh, there's a certain power dynamic between employer and potential employee, right? It's a power imbalance, uh, really. And you're just like, hmm, well, that might be the game as written, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in people. I like talking to people. Um, and even for somebody who maybe isn't as, you know, maybe naturally inclined, if you're just like, well, here's one way to win the game. Um, and then here's another way to, you know, help myself. Like, you know, I don't even want to call it a game, but it's like your career. It's like invest in yourself, invest in like the tool set. So just because there's one way of doing something doesn't mean that there aren't other ways in doing something. And I think over the past year with being online, maybe perhaps students that didn't feel as comfortable with online communications um, or communications in general, they've gotten a lot of practice. So even if it's something that you don't like to do, 
um, they probably okay with doing it and understanding, oh, okay. Well, even if I'm half as successful as Shauna, <laughs> like it'll, it'll be good practice and it'll be good to get to know people. And, you know, were there ever any conversations and don't name the company or the person, but where you found out more about um, them or the role and you were like, oh, I am not working there. I don't think so. I think honestly, with all the big four, like they're pretty much the same. Like, uh, there, no, actually, that's not true. With one of the companies or one of the firms um, that I was like talking to, uh, I was very heavily considering them when I was recruiting because when I was recruiting, it was always like Deloitte and them. I had the offers and they were the two firms that I was like very closely connected with. And I never picked them the entire way through. And I, at the end, I was like, Hey, maybe I've made a mistake. Like maybe like, should I consider this? I've always kind of gravitated back towards them. Like maybe this is something I should consider. And then after I did, like, after I had some more coffee chats, I was like, okay, I think I made the right choice to not. Um, It wasn't necessarily like anything bad where I was like, Oh my God, like this is awful. It was just like, I don't know if I necessarily click that well here but there were other firms where I was very against from the beginning and then after I talked to like the people in the department I was working with I was like okay I think like I like this firm a little better like I could see myself working here um but yeah like I I think it was important though to have those conversations because it a lot of times you think that there's a more rigid structure to like recruiting than there actually is. And MCS does a really good job of like connect and telling you like the right things to do. They're like, have these coffee chats. And I remember somebody telling me this where they're like, have these coffee chats. So when applications come out and they see your application, they remember your name, but you don't even have to get to that point. And that's kind of what I was doing. I was like, in August, I'm going to talk to all these people. So in September, when the applications come out, I'll, they'll remember my name, but it didn't even have to get to that point. So that like, also remember, like put yourself out there. And I, Sasha and I talked about this a lot when we lived together, because I would just like, I just do things. I, I I take that approach a lot where it's like, I will do things, never anything like bad, but I'll like bend the rules a little bit and I'll ask for forgiveness after if I, I won't usually break them or anything like that. No, I, no, I, if something's not explicitly stated not to do it just because nobody's doing it doesn't mean you can't try. Yeah. And like, I'll like read. So even with (laughs) when I became VP internal, there was like, you can't be VP internal and president of a society at the same time. And at first I was like, why not? But second, I was like, where does this say this? So I like Mm. read through the constitution a ton of times. And I was like, actually, I can do this. And I will. (laughs) Um, No, no, no. I love that. And I do, I do very, I, I connect with that a lot more than I can want to communicate right now, but I like that (laughs) because you advocate for yourselves. And there's the other thing, Shauna, is that there's oftentimes like this written, you know, template to how people should live their lives or how they feel like they should live their lives or how other people tell you, you should live your lives, either written or unwritten or spoken or unsaid. And it's like, that's bullshit. Like if you want to do something and you're not hurting anybody else and it's something you believe in just because it might not be the way, investigate it, try it, have a mini experiment, see if it'll work for you. See if it's something you want to invest more time in. Um, if it is, you know, something where people are like, oh no, you can't do that. Show me the rules. Like, let me know, like educate me. I want to understand why this is here. I want to understand where this is at, like asking the questions. And you've been, you know, shown evidence that you can do that while maintaining really good relationships, while advocating for yourself and while advocating for others. So I think that's exciting. So yeah, do it with, and you did it without apology. Like, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. I like, I, and I've told like my friends this all the time, whenever I like, I've asked my friends like, oh, okay. Like you're not doing this. Why? And then a lot of times if someone's like, you can't do this, I'm just like, why not? And then you keep going. And then if there's no concrete reason, why not just do it? Then that's kind of like how I go. Like I get a lot of things done, (laughs) like a lot of things that I a lot of people are like, you can't do this specifically with the sponsorship. Like a lot of my sponsorship, I think came from the fact that like, I had not only like people in within like the faculty telling me like, normally this doesn't work out. Like I have so many emails in like the president email of DAS that says, 
oh, corporate sponsorships usually don't work out for societies. And I was like, okay, well, it will. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have this thing where if I hear no, it kind of makes me want to try harder often. I see it like I reframe <laughs> it as a not yet. I was like, somebody's like, oh no, that's not possible. I was like, not yet, it isn't. <laughs> or like, sometimes I'll look at Eric and he'll be like, oh no, they said the magic <laughs> words. <laughs> I to- I completely get it. It's almost like an adrenaline rush where I'm like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Nobody's ever done that before. <laughs> and, <it's> like, yeah. <laughs> and the only thing I'll say is that um, in order to just like save my um, energy and mindset, now sometimes when I hear no, very occasionally, I just say, is this something, is this a hill for me? Like, do I want it? And oftentimes it's a yes, but sometimes it's like, you know, I'm okay. We'll let this one go. Or like, I was asking myself, I'm like, is there a bigger picture here? Is this, is this something that, you know, I want to, you know, invest the time and energy in? Um, and so that's, that's the only thing I don't, I don't see anything in the story where I'm like, Shana, really? Like, I don't know, but no, like, so it's not a reflection of advice or anything for you. It's just something that took me a bit. Um, but I will say, that there are all too many things um, that I have been fueled in in life. And now I'm definitely fueled both by the nose, but also by the supports, right? And it's good to kind of have that internal gut check. <laughs> that I'm not, somebody's like, you can't do that. And I'm like, oh, yes, I will. <laughs> For like, you know, silly things. And then you get like your worst enemy who's like, I bet you can't eat that crayon. And you're like, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> uh, okay. So, okay. You've done a lot in your fourth year. You've been involved, kept good grade, great grades, um, president, co-president, VP internal, like just got you done. <sighs> one case competitions, um, one presentations. So obviously you had zero time for any social life. <laughs> <laughs> not true (laughs) we'll keep it it calm on here um (laughs) but I am going to call you out just slightly okay and you can always email and I'll I'll edit this out but I recall seeing a poster um a poster for a party it was teal and it was pink and somebody (laughs) told me that you designed the poster is this correct or incorrect it is correct okay (laughs) So don't worry, we'll, we'll pretty much see it there. But what I will say is that I have no doubt, and I've seen the evidence, and I heard the stories afterwards. I have triangulated my data point, <laughs> and that um, you had a good fourth year, school wise, society wise, friend wise, and fun wise. Would that be correct? Yeah. And honestly, I would go about to say I had a really great social life all four years of university that and I think that's why very early on I figured out the study thing because I value my social life a lot. And I'm like not ashamed to say this. I love going out. I love going out with my friends. I love partying. I love having fun. And that's kind of what energizes me to do all these things in the five days. That's why I have that schedule so that my weekends are free for me to do stuff that I like to do. Like, and on top of like partying and all that stuff, like I love hiking and I love swimming and I love like getting into nature and like going and doing things. And I think it's like, but these are things that I value as well as like doing really well in school and being involved. So having that balance is super important to me because I don't think I would get that involved or like do that well in school if I didn't have this other aspect of it. So I know like a lot of people don't like going out as much as I do. And a lot of people might like going out more, but it's important to have that balance because that's, it's part of what makes a really great university experience. Yeah. (laughs) Love it. Sorry. (laughs) Oh man. For that poster that you saw, Mm -hmm. there was a 2.0 that happened over the summer. (laughs) Bravo. You're in Queens? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So not only can it be done and you've proven it during undergrad, but go to a graduate diploma uh, in accounting and it can be done as well. All right. Yep. (laughs) Very nice. Very nice. Uh, do you, I don't know if we've ever talked about this or no, we haven't. Um, do you listen to any like podcasts or read or listen to any audiobooks uh, either, you know, that you would recommend to say professor or uh, fourth years or 
Um, somebody gave me a really good podcast recommendation um, the other week. And I'm like, oh, this is great. I'm learning stuff for myself, but really more so for like students, things that other, um, you know, third or fourth years or recent grads or, you know, relatively recent alumni might like. Um, so I, there's, there is one book that I'll get to, but I think this, like, this is partially, this kind of circles back to that club thing where I was like, do things that you like doing, where a ton of clubs release like podcasts they're listening to or like books that they're reading. And I just don't do that. Like I, if I'm reading a book or if I'm listening to a podcast, it's fictional or it has something to do with my interest. So like, I like the serial podcast that talks about like true crime. Yeah, and yeah, no, this is the stuff I want. Like this is, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I was like, I read that question. I was like, I don't listen to any motivational podcast at all. <laughs> no, no, but it can be motivational if it's just something you like, right? Oh and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, so um, serial, serial. Yeah. I listen to NPR planet money, but I'll yeah. only listen to the episodes that are less than 15 minutes because I can't focus if it's more than that, but it, they're usually pretty interesting. Like there's one about the Birkin bag, like just the yeah. economics behind like random subjects. So I listen to that. Sometimes my favorite one at the moment is called bros. Listen to PLL two, or bros watch PLL two. And it's pretty much these two, like I think they're like 20 or late 20 year old guys that watch pretty little liars. And then they'll do a podcast on the episode. <laughs> And it's hilarious. They're so funny. Um, so I watch, I listen to those. I read a lot of fiction. Um, I'll like reread like the Twilight Saga and like those kind of things. But one book that I do recommend for like students, like profs, everyone, it's Dale Carnegie's How to Influence People and like Win Friends or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, that Dale book- Carnegie's has, is it Seven Rules or something? Yes, or it's yeah. that one perfect so I I had a tax partner in the Halifax office he retired this year um and he like is probably like my biggest role model and he's been kind enough since I did my part-time there he's mentored me every week and what we would do is we would read like a chapter of this book and we would talk about it and we would talk about like what that looks like for him and what that looks like for me and I think that was very fulfilling because we're very different like the way that we were who we are as people one and like just the different factors of our life are very, very different too. So I think it was very important for me to kind of get that perspective from someone else and someone who's like in the career that I could see myself being in at a level that I would like to be at and getting his insight from his experience. And he thought it was like really important um, for him to see it from my experience. That was just Mm. so different from his. And like, we saw things in completely different ways and we understood things in completely different ways. And he told me like, at the beginning, he was like, I read this book like once every few months. And I, at the time I was like, okay, I am not doing that. But now I can totally see the value in that. Like sometimes if I'm struggling with something or, and I come back to these seven rules all the time because I can be a little like short fused sometimes. And so a lot of times, or like sometimes when I don't get my way, I get very like, okay, what am I doing wrong? But instead of going to that, I'm just like, okay, what can I do instead? Like, how can the, like, I, I can see this conversation or this situation or this relationship going in a certain way. What can these seven rule, like, what can I take from this so that it doesn't go that way? And this like book has helped me with like work and school and relationships and friendships and everything. So I think just overall, it's a great book to read. Great. No, thank you. I definitely have a copy and I can't even re- recite one rule right now. So uh, <laughs> I guess it's time for me to go back and reread. So thank you for the prompt. Um, absolutely. Okay. I'm going to ask you the tough question. Um, people either hate this question or really hate this question. I think a few secretly <laughs> like it or would want to hear other people. Uh, so Shauna, how would you define success? I think for me, success has always been like three years ago, would I have liked that my life turned out this way? Like it used to be three years ago. Am I hitting all the goals that I wanted for myself three Mm. years from then? And then I'm a lot of times the answer was no, but I'm happy. Like, I'm glad I didn't do that. And so I think for me, it's just like, okay, three years ago, would I be happy with how I am right now? And 
I like for me, that's success. Like if I'm happy with what I'm doing, like work-wise, school-wise, friendship-wise, relationship-wise, and I feel happy in the moment, then I think I'm successful. And like, I, I'm very intrinsically motivated. Like I, I can be competitive, but a lot of times when I'm measuring like success or happiness or anything like that, it's against myself. Um, because that's the only way that I feel like it's fair for me. And I think a lot of times it's like, you're uh, people are really hard on themselves and I am too where I'm just like I should be further I should be doing this I should be doing that but I think it's really important to consider like grounding yourself and are you happy with where you are no okay like what can you do to get there and for me that's what success is like I'm happy and I know three years ago if I had told myself this is what I'm doing now I would have been happy with it love that (laughs) yeah no we're all running our own race right there is no um everyone's read somewhere that it's like don't sprint so hard to get to the end because like it's all a journey and so you've given permission to yourself to me to others that if you are not somewhere where three years ago you'd be proud of then ask yourself what can you do or I would even venture to say ask yourself why and if it's because you're measuring yourself not something you would do but something they would might do if it's because you're measuring yourself against, you know, social media or somebody else or some, like anything that's not your own goals, maybe ask, is that the best measurement, right? Like you said, it's not fair. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to others. And, you know, you've been a leader at school and I have no doubt you'll continue to be a leader um, throughout your career. And the one thing that really um, stuck with me was, wait, if I'm so hard on myself and if I'm measuring myself against this objective that I'll never hit versus playing my own game, what does that, what does that communicate to other people out there and what they should be doing? Because if we're talking to ourselves in a way that we would never let anybody else talk to us and that we would never allow for anybody to talk to any one of our mentees or friends or anybody, then why the hell would we talk to ourselves like that? So Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, we all just want to be a little bit, a little bit better. And the three years is such a perfect time because life isn't linear, you know. Um, but if we look at trend lines, three years is a good is a good measure. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And just a, like a funny comment to that so at the beginning of the year I find like especially through quarantine um a lot of people were really hard on themselves and like it was so easy to talk to yourself really poorly so at the beginning of the year like a ton of my friends like when we first started like going out again and dressing up like maybe some people didn't look the way they wanted to or some people didn't feel that great and like they would just say it about themselves and I saw this somewhere on like a vine or a video once and it was like would you say that about your best friend newsflash you are your own best friend (laughs) And then we would just say it to each other all like whenever someone said something bad about themselves, like immediately we would scream that at them and um, it worked. Like, like, I guess eventually, like when people are like saying that about you so much, like you start to, cause I'm guilty of that too. And then I've had my friends yell that back at me. So it just make sure you're not being like too hard on yourself. And uh, surround yourself by, with people that will lift you up right? And that you want to lift Mm -hmm. up. Um, That's really, really cool. Um, Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up there, Shauna. Um, I really like, thank you for taking all this time and for imparting a lot of wisdom um, for our, for our little Dal accounting community, right? Like you said, it's, it's big, but it's small and you can get involved as much or as little as you want. Um, Final comments or anything else to add? Um, I think just for like the fourth year is like, this is your last year of university and accounting is hard, but make sure you're having fun and you're being good to yourself during all of it. Um, Not getting a job or not getting like the best grade isn't the worst thing in the world. Like it's not going to kill you. Um, You had mentioned this before, but if anybody ever wanted to reach out to me, um, my LinkedIn is just my name. So (laughs) um, you can find me on there and send me a message or I'll link link down below. Perfect. Yeah. Um, But just make sure you have a great year and it's in person. So make sure you're enjoying that too. And yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for having me on, Sam. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.